Well, hello everyone. It's uh, great to see so many familiar faces. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the final instalment of Robert Orme's fan fascinating series on lunch of lunchtime lectures on magical art. Over the past few weeks, we've delved into the origins of magical art, discussed occult visions, heard about the changing beliefs around witchcraft is expressed in, in art, and entered the left-hand path of the modern occult. This afternoon's finale of the Magical Art series promises to be as fascinating as previous lectures. Today, we will move from the myths of how art has been claimed to originate from magic to how its effects can be magical for us. Many of you joining today know that these talks aim to raise money for the bursary in Robert's name which enables talented and able students to join Latimer's sixth form to study history of art or history. Robert's events have brought in over 2,500 pounds in donations, making up a whopping 20% of our virtual event donations. That's truly inspiring. As ever, thank you so much for your support. Every gift really makes a difference. Finally, a couple of house rules. Everyone will be placed on mute so you can all hear the talk clearly. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat facility so that we can review them and so that Robert can answer as many as time allows at the end of his talk. Now, please join me in welcoming Latimer legend Robert Orme for the fifth and final lecture in his series on magical art, how art really can be magical. Thank you. Up until now, we've been dealing with artists who did actually believe in the occult and magic. And we've seen how the ideas of magic appeared in different styles of art at different times. But as you've heard today, we're going to look at the ways in which art itself has actually been called magic and its origins derive from magic. And then finally, I'm going to go on to try and explain in what ways I can find some art really magical. Uh, the most common cliche you hear if you go to any art gallery is that they look at some painting or a portrait or something and they talk about how wonderful it is, how alive it is, how the eyes seem to follow you. And there have been in history all kinds of myths about how the origin of art itself is magical. And these are what are called etiological myths. And if we start, we're going to look at some examples of uh, Greek myths about the origin of art. And in particular, for example, uh, with the uh, work of um, Daedalus. Now, this is a Roman relief of uh, Daedalus, and you can see that he is shown as a craftsman sitting at his, in his studio, and he's busy making wax wings that are going to go on to Icarus and cause his flight and uh, fall. But Daedalus was a mythical figure who has links maybe back even to Minoan culture, and in lots of uh, the stories of Greek mythology, he was regarded as a great inventor. He was a carpenter, he was a builder. And then he was also supposed to have been an artist and a um, sculptor. And his sculptures were supposed to be a new kind of lifelike kind of image, which is probably fitting in with the new way in which the archaic Greek sculpture developed into more lifelike kind of forms. And in particular, he was supposed to be a mechanical genius, and he was supposed to be able to create automata. And there's a famous story in Plato where Socrates talks about how when Daedalus made sculptures, they had to actually be chained to the plinth on which they wear because they had a tendency to literally run away. In other words, he could actually create images that were so lifelike that actually did come alive. And he was supposed to put things like quicksilver into them and then make them actually speak. And therefore, there have been lots of these myths about the originators of art actually using magic to bring things alive. Now, probably the most famous of all these stories is going to obviously be the myths of Pygmalion. And these pictures are from the series that were painted by Edward Byrne Jones in the 1870s, which retell those myths about Pygmalion. And the basic text for these myths is going to be from Ovid's Metamorphoses. And the text implies that Pygmalion had never actually fallen in love with a woman, but he was a skilled sculptor. And in this picture here, he has just finished and made a mar uh, um, an ivory figure of a nude woman, and he's looking at it and admiring it. 
And the story is about how he thought that it was so beautiful that he began to fall in love with it. And therefore he prayed to Venus, the goddess of love. And this next picture shows you the way in which Venus, the goddess actually appears in his studio with the little doves around her at her feet. And as you can see, she is touching the statue and the statue comes alive. And therefore this becomes a real woman who actually Pygmalion can now fall in love with. Uh, the Burne Jones version is fairly timid where he simply kneels and worships her for her beauty and kisses her hand. But the Ovid Metamorphoses makes it much more erotic because he embraces her, he kisses her, and as he kisses her cold lips, he then begins to feel them actually come warm and become a, a real person. Now that is a widespread myth in lots of different world cultures and even became a psychological disorder in the late 19th century of what was called Pygmalionism by Kraft Ebbing in his Psychopathia Sexualis. And therefore it's now viewed as a psychological paraphilia where you actually fall in love with a statue as if it is really alive. So there's a mythical tradition from Greek where actually the magic of art is that you actually create by art things that are made from physical material world but come alive as real people. But this isn't only a pagan myth, this is also part of the Christian tradition. And the principal image of what Jesus is actually like is one that actually is supposed to have a magical kind of um, origin. Uh, this is the woman in the Bible who is described as being there when Jesus is carrying the cross up to Golgotha to be crucified. And obviously it's in the heat of the day. And the Bible describes a woman who comes forward from the crowd. Uh, she has a handkerchief and she write, wipes sweat from the brow of Jesus. Now, then you get a miracle or magical transformation where the sweat on the cloth actually becomes the imprint of the very face of Jesus himself. And this is Memlink's version of the woman, Veronica, who wiped his brow. And then this close up is actually of um, the uh, image itself, which became the standard kind of image of what Jesus should look like. Uh, there were all sorts of textual descriptions of what the image was like in Byzantine literature. Then it becomes the basis of the Byzantine iconic image of Jesus, which survived in Russia into the 20th century and probably even now. And then as we've just seen in the, the Memling painting and the Van Eyck here, it became the norm for actually what Jesus should look like in paintings in the Christian Middle, Western Middle Ages with long hair down by his cheeks, with the beard, uh, with the soulful expression, the flattened forehead. And this became the literally iconic image of Jesus. And it functioned as an icon for you to pray to. And you are actually seeing Jesus because this is the true icon, the vera icon in Greek. In other words, it's not a painted representation, a portrait of Jesus, but according to the legend, it is actually the real representation of Jesus himself. And the woman whose handkerchief took the sweat and became the painting is called Saint Veronica. And as you can see, that is actually a portmanteau word, not referring to any real person, but simply referring to what she did, because she created a Vera icon. That is the origin of the name Veronica. So Saint Veronica is a mythical saint whose name comes from the fact that the Christians believe that God, through miracle and magic, could actually create a painting that was the living representation, the real presence of uh, Jesus himself. This sort of thing was also confirmed in lots of medieval stories of statues and paintings come alive, and in particular in the story of the Mass of St Gregory. Uh, St Gregory was Pope in the sixth century, and what you've got here is a story that was recounted in lots of medieval texts, mainly the Golden Legend, which was the most popular version of mm, saint stories around, about what happened to St. Gregory one day when he was doing the mass. He is kneeling at the altar. He has got the bread and on a plate. And now he's taken the cup and he's holding up the cup and he is saying the words in the service of, uh, and this is your blood which is shed for me, do this in remembrance, etc. 
where, as you know, in the Roman Catholic tradition still today, there is a belief in transubstantiation. The substance of the wine is transformed into the very blood of Christ. And this story of the Mass of St. Gregory was frequently painted because it's obviously a good visual proof of the reality of the real presence of Jesus. Because as he holds up the cup, you can see how the little figure has actually emerged from the painting on the altarpiece behind. And he has literally stepped forward. You can see that he's put his hand to the right hand side of his chest and he's squeezing the wound where Longinus had pierced Jesus on the cross with a spear. And as he squeezes, literally blood comes out of this living image of Christ, which has appeared on the altar, and it pours into the cup, which is then given by the Pope to the communicants. Now that's a fairly crude sort of popularizing image. When you get to the higher quality art of somebody like Dürer doing an image of this, what you see here is the way in which the mass is taking place. You can see that uh, on the altar, you have all the symbols of the passion. And then you can see that Dürer, because he's a Renaissance artist, has the ability to actually bring the figure much more to life in terms of giving it a physical body and muscularity. And you can see how he comes forward offering himself, offering his blood to the cup below, which means that you've got the guarantee of actually having the real presence of Jesus with you in the church when you go to the Roman Catholic mass. So therefore you have these stories of the very real presence of Jesus. Now there are lots of um, stories from medieval literature and myth which are about um, these statues that actually have the real presence of God and the soul of God inside them. And one of the most famous involves a rather severe saint called Bernard of Clairvaux. And Bernard of Clairvaux was famously a 12th century restorer of monasticism, but he was also a mystic. And he left lots of texts of the mystical experiences that he had. And one of the most famous was this, which you can see here in little 15th century, early 16th century uh, manuscript. In what you've got is, as you can see, him kneeling and praying to a crucifix, the image of Jesus nailed to the cross. But he describes how the image literally came to life. It literally floats off the cross. It actually embraces him. He holds it. And there's a really strange text that Bernard wrote where he is not only embracing, but he also describes literally kissing uh, Jesus. And therefore you have this miracle where the statue does come to life as if by magic. Now that's a pious Book of Hours illustration that inspires you to pray to Jesus. The next picture is going to show you the way in which in the 17th century, by the time of uh, Caravaggio, you begin to get much more physical reality in these images of Jesus peering to St. Bernard. Uh, Bernard kneels, but this time you've got physically present, a very strongly painted uh, Caravaggesque light and shade kind of figure of a powerful masculine Jesus who has come completely away from the cross, who is there in the presence of the saint and who is, who is kneeling to him, praying to him, touching him and about to kiss him. Therefore, you have these legends where the saints had visions of uh, crucifixes that came to life. And it wasn't only the statues that came to life, you also got to the stage where you could have situations where with the saint, you've actually got the real presence of the saint if you went on a pilgrimage. Uh, the next picture is here. Uh, it's slightly off center, Tony, on the screen. If you could move it across slightly to uh, the, my right, to my left. Um, what you've got here is a little fragment of medieval stained glass, which shows you what the practice was of pilgrims uh, when they went to Canterbury. Uh, you walk down there, you get into the cathedral on your knees, the final steps you are supposed to scrawl on your belly, and then if you are a special visitor, or perhaps if you paid extra, you could get a bed. And this is what is called incubation, where the pilgrim has gone to Canterbury and has now had the bed by the pilgrim 
at the Saints, Saints Shrine to actually spend the night. And you've got in the top right the actual reliquary of St Thomas, which no longer exists. It was destroyed in the Reformation. And you can see that it was a typical reliquary made probably out of wood and then covered in gold leaf and with stories from the saint's life on it. And inside was going to be the real body of Thomas of Becket. And this story recounts how this particular pilgrim in the night suddenly had this vision where the body of the saint, the relics of the saint, did actually come to life. And you can see the saint literally flying out of the reliquary, hovering above the sleeping pilgrim, hand extended and offering him blessing and uh, comfort. And therefore there's been a long tradition in ancient Greek mythology, but also in Christian mythology of the Middle Ages of these images being able to actually come to life as if by magic. So you've got this long tradition of mythical belief in art originating from magic. But in the 19th century, you begin to get new development of psychological theories, which are going to try and explain the origins of art. And in the middle of the 19th century, you have the influence of somebody like Charles Darwin, where he is trying to explain what has happened to the evolution of the human species in the evolution of species in 1859. But then he also wrote a book in 1872, The Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals. And he believed that art actually had a biological origin. He believed that art was actually originating from the very process of evolution itself. Evolution relied on selection of the fittest mates and therefore the survival of the species and the progress of the species. And he therefore developed in this book a theory of how plants, birds, animals develop means of expression by which they could attract mates. And the next picture shows you funny little illustrations that uh, appear from his children who were illustrating the actual manuscript of the evolution of species. And you can see how they've delighted in drawing the wonderful colors of the butterfly and the patterns, the plants, the birds and so on. And therefore Darwin's theory was that art was actually an expression of biological necessity where all these different levels of biological existence, the plants, the birds, the animals and so on, developed these kind of displays which were going to make use of an appeal of color and they were also going to make use of a uh, pattern. And that therefore the origin of art itself was going to be biological. So they were attempting to replace the mythical explanations of things with a more scientific development and the real theory of the way in which art was actually going to be out of magic grew out of the work not so much of the biologists but of the um, psychologists who followed them. Uh, this is Edward Tyler who produced this book in 1871 called primitive culture. And what he was doing was to take the ideas of biological evolution and then try to apply them to the way in which um, human behavior had developed. And he would be categorized as a very important influential early 19th century anthropologist. And what he did was to try and study the existence and survivals and uh, ways of life of primitive peoples. And then he developed the notion of cultural anthropology, where you're going to actually have a study of the kinds of ritual behavior that people develop, and in particular, the kind of origins of religion itself. And he was famous for producing in this book uh, a theory of what he called animism. The theory of animism was that in a pre-scientific period, people did not understand what were the real scientific causes of events in the world that were affecting their lives. And therefore, instead of thinking that it was actually down to the forces of meteorology, the forces of the environment, uh, the forces of nature that were creating the environment in which culture developed, they tended to think that actually all the things around them had a kind of life force in them that was affecting them. And then religion, is going to be the way in which you placate these forces that are there in nature. And you can pray to them, 
you can libate them, you can worship them, you can make sacrifices to them, all these kind of things that you can do, which are the primitive way of actually modifying um, the world around you so that you have a better chance of actual um, survival. And he believed in animism, and that is what he called this belief in how things that are not really animate seem to magically become alive as if they are human. And he developed a theory also of magic called sympathetic magic, where something that is like something else was going to have an effect on it. So there was the old doctrine of signatures where if you have a plant that is in the shape of a liver, then liver wart is going to be something that you will take because it's a medicine for your liver. And therefore these ideas of primitive culture helped him to formulate also an idea of actually what was going to be the origin of art because he came to think that primitive art was actually a form of sympathetic magic. Now that was 1871 and by the early 20th century anthropologists and archaeologists knowledge of primitive art was vastly expanded by the researches and discoveries that were made and some of the most famous of these discoveries were going to be often accidental finds of things like caves with these incredible in. Uh, this is the interior of Lascaux in the Dordogne in France, which was discovered in 1940. And when you went in, you could see on the roof above you all these incredible paintings of all these different animals. Uh, now you can only visit a replica, but this is the original. And the art that they discovered really seemed truly astonishing. Uh, they were of creatures and beasts which were often going to be not of the um, period that still existed, so they knew how old these things were going to actually be. So if you look at this image here, again Tony, if you can move it slightly across, you can't see the head at the moment. Um, what you've got here is an image which is of the type of creatures that were around when these cave paintings were produced. That's the whole image now, thank you. Um, and what you've got here is something incredible and marvellous. These images are 25 to 30,000 years old. These are people living in a stone age, and yet they have the ability to, first of all, actually observe, then remember in their mind's eye uh, what the creature actually looks like. Then they have developed the desire to paint them. Then they have developed the skill by which they can actually start to portray exactly what the features are, just simply by the quality of the kind of outline that they can draw. So they're truly outstanding in terms of the artistic work that they create. And there are lots of these that have survived. Here's another example of the same kind of thing, where you've got one that has got the same pattern of its uh, actual outline, but you've got this time more colouring added to it that gives it slightly more uh, three-dimensionality. And then you get to ones like this, which are going to have on it uh, the kind of way in which they capture not only the genuine outline of a wild beast, but also look at the sense of movement that you have with the forward impetus of the creature and the movement of the legs. And then you get astonishing things like these deer, where you actually have here an image which is incredibly sophisticated in terms of First of all, the outline. Then you have the uh, way in which colours are applied. So you get a sense of uh, the skin texture. You also get a sense again, because of the way in which volume is created, of the three-dimensional reality of the creature. And then if you look at the kind of aesthetic sensibility that's creating it, stay on it, don't move on. Uh, you've got the sen aesthetic sensibility of the horns, which have these wonderful, beautiful kind of shapes, which they often took and cut and were woven into musical instruments and all sorts of things. And then you can see how the sense of pattern of the horns is repeated in the outline of the haunches and the belly of the creatures. And therefore, you have this astounding discovery of the quality of primitive art in the early 20th century. Now, Lascaux was discovered in 1940. And this picture shows you the man who made it famous, 
uh, Henri Breuil. And what you've got here is Henri Breuil visiting the caves in 1940 when they were first discovered. And he's looking up, isn't he, in wonder at all these creatures. And Breuil was an archaeologist and he then developed a theory as to what was the origin of why these cave paintings were created. And his theory was that the paintings are a form of hunting magic. He believed that these images were of the creatures that these wild people had to hunt in order to survive, and that what they did was to paint them, he would have argued, uh, sort of on the day before a hunt, and then by ritual to make it more likely that they would actually kill the animal in a hunt the next day. Because they claim to find, like in this next picture, they claim to find um, examples where there was an animal and then those straight lines that you can see in the center above it are meant to be uh, arrows as if they're actually showing a hunt of this creature where the arrows are being uh, fired at the victim. And this would of course be an example of Tyler's theory of animism and sympathetic magic because you would have claimed that when you created an image of the creature, you were actually capturing its soul. And therefore, by sympathetic magic, what you did to the painting of the animal would happen in reality to the animal the next day. And the next picture shows the way in which they often found sort of little bits of rock carving, which they could reshape and make into again, thing like a, um, a, a bison. Uh, they could then paint it. And then there were lots of stories that archaeologists put around in the middle of the 20th century, that they didn't just paint them red as the actual blood, which is the life force of the animal, which they're putting onto these carvings. Uh, they claim that they actually found in crevices uh, remnants of blood that had been smeared, or that animal cloths, animals' um, skins were put over the paintings and the statues. And they claim that they found pit marks on the statues, and then they found arrowheads on below, as if there'd been some ritual the night before a hunt, where they had actually gone in and they had shot things at these animals, so that what you did to the image, which contained the soul, the anima of the creature, would then happen in reality the next day to the animal that you were hunting. Just as remarkable as these um, cave paintings of uh, animals, they began to also find the furthest, first earliest examples of sculptures of the human form. So if you go to Vienna today, you can go and see this, which is the Venus of Willendorf. And this is the famous example found in 1908 of this kind of Venus of prehistoric times, which has got certain characteristics, which again, the anthropologist and archeologist tried to interpret as a form of sympathetic magic. Uh, she's got a frizzy hairstyle, which must have been presumably fashionable. Uh, she's then got this extremely fat kind of profile where there is lots of fat on her body, particularly around the hips and the stomach. And the theory was that actually, if you were living in an ice age and in caves, then you were going to actually be very liable to die if you were thin. Therefore, one of the prerequisites of existence in those periods would have been to have plenty of body fat. So therefore, fat is beautiful. And having a body like this made you uh, would make you more likely to actually survive. But they are also predominantly going to be kind of uh, sexual magic because they have these enormous breasts, they have enlarged kind of hips, they have not just a belly but also probably a womb, and therefore they have this image of being a kind of fertility doll where if this is your partner then she is going to actually be made pregnant by the very process of making this sculpture. And there have been dozens of these prehistoric images found. This is a kind of one that is more to do with being more primitive and more realistic, whereas some of them come actually quite sophisticated. If you look here, you can see how it's got all the same characteristics where it's not the personality of the woman, the face, the uh, individuality, it's instead the breasts and the belly and the stomach and so on that are actually what matter. But again, you can see the way in which the person who, the people who created this have actually carved it. So there's a continuous kind of form that is repeating in the shape of the breasts, the curves of the 
uh, shoulders and the hips and the head and so on, and therefore creating a kind of art, which again, these people claim had been to do with this kind of origin of art from magic. And anthropologists also claim that this is how primitive people viewed photography when they first encountered it. Uh, this is the sort of image that was produced by photographers in America in the 19th century of Indians in chiefs in their full regalia and so on. And there were lots of legends that were spread around by explorers and sometimes believed by anthropologists where they claimed that actually uh, Red Indians were frightened of cameras and objected to having their photos taken and that they would actually get very frightened that you might actually take their photo and threaten to literally tear it up. And if they believed that the image was literally a camera sucking their soul from them and putting it into the image, then by tearing it up, you would indeed be liable to harm them. And this kind of belief is almost universal and widespread in that old superstition, which is that you look in a mirror and if the mirror breaks, you're then going to have seven years of bad luck. And this is the same idea that actually somehow the realistic image is actually magical, that it is actually capturing a soul and that it can actually come alive. Therefore, all through prehistoric times, right through to probably the 19th, 20th century, it's been possible to find examples of these myths which claim that art itself is magical and has a magical power. But as you know, I don't believe in magic and I believe that magic is basically how Freud describes it, where things that are to do with magic are to do with either the projection of your fears or the projection of your wish fulfillment. And therefore, I do believe that you can actually talk about art being magical but not because it's any kind of real magic, but because of how psychologically it works. And I like that metaphor of magical as a metaphor to describe what are some of the kind of effects that you can get in art because of the skills of the artist, which have a magical effect on the viewer. And what I'm now gonna do is to try and pick out some of those qualities in art that I really enjoy, which I feel are almost magical. I'm going to start with what you might call magical realism, which is not going to be to do with uh, the sort of ideas of um, the um, uh, writers and filmmakers and painters of the mid 20th century, where you mix reality and fantasy together, but instead the kind of magical realism that I think begins to appear first in the Renaissance. So if you look at um, a drawing like this by Leonardo from around about 1500, you're looking at one of the main developments of Renaissance art, where they developed incredible skills by which they could actually create from simply paper and a pen and some ink, an image that seems to have a kind of magical life of its own. This is one of his famous anatomical drawings. Uh, he was dissecting a woman who died in pregnancy. And he had in front of him this presumably horrendous bloody image, and yet he had the intellectual clarity to observe very, very carefully and try and then imitate the reality of the fetus in the womb in ways that had probably never been drawn actually before. And what he did was to observe exactly what he saw. He could record it in his mind's eye and then he had the skill in his hand to transform these mental images into these strokes of the pen on the page. And when you go into close up, you can see how he worked at producing this image. And he's simply a flat piece of paper in a notebook. He has a pen, he has a brownish kind of ink, and then he has this ability, doesn't he, to draw outlines of things accurately. Men, by using this kind of hatching, these kind of quick movements of his hand that create the little curved movements around the head or the arm or the shoulder or the thigh of the little 
petiphal fetus in the womb. And therefore he has this incredible skill to actually create a magical reality out of a piece of paper and some ink so that you feel in the real presence of an actual what had been living fetus that he had in front of him this day in Florence when he did this drawing. And he didn't only rely on line and outline. This picture here of hands is famous for another skill that he actually developed. Uh, the Renaissance believed that in order to take a flat piece of paper, you had to show light and shadow. You had to do chiaroscuro. And Leonardo famously developed new techniques of uh, chiaroscuro. Obviously, he's showing the very detailed outline of the fingers and so on, and the uh, wrist. But then on the hands themselves, you have this incredible transition from the white highlights to the darker shadows. And early chiaroscuro is quite crude, whereas Leonardo was famous for developing what was called sfumato. And by sfumato, it meant the ability to have incredibly soft transitions from dark to light, gradations where you couldn't see the change as if you were looking through a sort of smoke screen. And therefore, he begins to create this incredibly rounded effect, doesn't he, of the hands that look 3D and present and full of emotional expression. Therefore, I think personally that lots of the achievements of these Renaissance artists are worthy of being called almost magical in their recreation of reality. But another way in which Renaissance art uh, developed was through the use of um, rhetoric. You probably mostly associate rhetoric with speaking and writing. And indeed, that is actually its origin. If you go back to the books on rhetoric by Aristotle and Cicero and Quintilian, they are actually about the art of speech making. And the art of speech making involved all sorts of rhetorical devices that you should use to persuade the emotions of an audience. But they also have sections in their books about how you don't simply use words, but you should also use another language which will increase the impact and effect of your speech. And by that, they meant body language. They urged you as a writer to study the way in which actually uh, the emotions are expressed through the expressions of a face, the movements of a hand, the pose of a body, and so on. And therefore, the Renaissance followed the ideas of the poet Horace, who said that ut pictura poesis, as is poetry, so is painting, by which he meant that painting is simply silent poetry. And you don't have words with which you can rouse the emotions of your audience, but you do have a visual language of body gesture. And one of the works that I think most wonderfully embodies this is this last Pieta by Michelangelo that you can see in uh, Florence. And you have the image of Nicodemus, probably the man who uh, provided the tomb for Jesus, holding up the body of the dead Christ, Mary beside him, embracing him. And then you have this body language of Jesus where you have this sagging weight in the body that gives you a very strong sense and feeling of dead Jesus, the death of Jesus, and therefore is meant to evoke your grief. And in particular, the body language that seems to me most expressive is actually the figure of Nicodemus himself. And when you look here, there is particularly, I don't think any doubt at all, but that this is actually a Michelangelo self-portrait. There are lots of portraits of Michelangelo. He famously had broken his nose when he was young and therefore had a slightly kinky nose like this. And therefore, this is almost certainly the last self-portrait of Michelangelo. And this Pieta was actually meant to have been prepared for his tomb to go on it. And at the end of his life, he became very religious. He wrote lots of religious poetry. He was constantly praying to Jesus for uh, forgiveness for the sins of his life. And he identified strongly with the suffering of Jesus. And therefore, what Michelangelo has done for me is in this face here to create an incredibly expressive image of actually sorrow. You have these very deep set eyes created by the lighting and the shadow. Then you have the face, which is the saggy face of the old man. And then you have a peculiarity where 
Michelangelo may have even almost deliberately lied to actually leave sculptures unfinished. And this one has not been finally polished. And what you have are the actual marks of the smaller chisels that Michelangelo was working on on the face. And therefore he's able to actually create this kind of texture on the skin. And for me, magically create an image of himself, his own last feelings, his own last sorrows, as he works on the final sculpture for his tomb. So the Renaissance had brought in literally realism. It also brought in a new kind of magical expression. And the genre, and genre that develops in the Renaissance is obviously going to be portraiture. But to me, most portraits are very boring uh, and not enjoyable because they actually always seem to only work in terms of the period in which they are created. You look at somebody in a portrait from the 17th century and you expect to see a certain type of face which was a fashionable face to have, a certain sort of clothing, a certain sort of behaviour that meets and fits with the social role and therefore I don't personally find portraits very inspiring but there are some portrait painters who seem to me to go beyond that and to make me feel as if they can magically transcend time. And I might have chosen as my examples um, Rembrandt, but I've actually chosen examples here from Vermeer. And what seems to me remarkable about these Vermeer pictures is that they don't actually look like 17th century people set in a historical time frame. They instead, to me, seem to have a kind of real presence. This girl is thought to have been an actual a servant girl who had been working in his studio. Uh, some of the things around in the picture appear in other paintings as props. And therefore, Vermeer, as a portrait painter, has this incredible skill of looking at a person and seeing the real person doing real things. So he's able to um, observe very closely the minute gestures of her fingers and hands as she works on the lace. He is then able to capture, isn't he, the uh, way in which her head bows down as she has to concentrate on the minute work that she's doing. And then he has the physical skill of chiaroscuro to create her as a three-dimensional embodied figure, and then to give the expression of emotional intensity to the face, as if you are actually meeting a real person who will be alive and with you in the world today. And I think this is what has actually made this picture of the girl with the pearl earring such an iconic image in Western culture in the 21st century. It's inspired lots of uh, writing, uh, lots of fantasies about who she is and what the stories are behind her. And it's because of his skill as a painter to actually uh, create a magical image of this timeless girl. Uh, she's not in a particular costume that relates directly to the period in Holland when she existed. She's a kind of fantasy costume. And then she is posed, poised, to actually be caught at this moment where her head turns. Then she's painted these rather large eyes that literally stare out at us. Then he's painted the lips just slightly parting, as if she is speaking, is about to speak has just seen us. And then he has this wonderful skill of actually creating the three-dimensional reality of her face structure by the incredibly gentle chiaroscuro on her cheekbone. And then you add to that the subtlety of the colour relationships. And this kind of um, portrait, again, seems to me to do exactly what the myths say. It seems to actually give you the presence as if by magic, of a real person. Now that is so far implied that uh, magical art needs to actually be realistic. But I would argue that there are also certain aesthetic qualities of art which are going to actually have a magical effect and do so by the aesthetics, not just by the realism. And one of my favourite paintings that I've known since I first saw it in Venice in the 1960s 
is going to be this little painting by Giorgione called the Tempest, the Tempesta. And this painting is done in about 1510 in Venice. Uh, it's a strange subject, nobody quite knows what it's actually about. There's a possible soldier on the left in this red kind of cloak. You've got the woman feeding a baby at her breast on the right. And then what actually appeals to me is the way in which the colour sense has a magical effect on me. I think that colour effects are very difficult to pinpoint and to explain, but I've always assumed that they must be something to do with association and memory. And what you've got here is a new use of colour, which I don't think had appeared much before Giorgione's time. If you think of that medieval stained glass, you have these fantastic bright colours. If you think of uh, Bellini in the earlier 15th century, painting with wonderful new oil paints in Venice and creating fantastic paintings of bright uh, luminous, luminous colours. Whereas what I particularly enjoy in Giorgione is colour harmony, because you've got this painting of a storm. The clouds in the background definitely have blue in them. Then there is a little streak of yellow, which is the lightning, and it's not actually, it's actually much brighter in reality than you can see in this image. And then in the foreground, you've got this little stream and it comes past some rocks and it comes to a little sandy bay. And again, you have yellow. And what you have here is this relationship of colors together. You have the blue of the clouds, you have the yellow of the um, flesh tones and the sand. And then you get the trees, which have this color that is pretty much unique to Giorgione, where he takes the blue and the yellow and he blends them together into this kind of almost olive kind of green. And it's this harmonization of colors together, which always seems particularly magical to me in Giorgione. And this by Giorgione had an uh, immediate and di uh, dynamic effect on me for the rest of my life from the 1960s onwards. And you can literally still see it today on me. I was obviously notorious for bad taste in clothing for decrepit clothing when I was a teacher and continuously wearing the same kind of things. And you can see how actually I haven't changed that much since, because if you look at the shirt that I like to wear, it's this kind of red color, which is meant to be an approximation of the color of the soldier in the Giorgione Tempest. And then if you look at the rather shabby jacket that I'm wearing, I wore these kind of corduroy jackets with this kind of uh, color of sort of green in them. So there I'm sitting, it's got this kind of greenish kind of color on it. And therefore I made uh, Giorgione's color sense, the model for my own infamous color sense. And I've always particularly enjoyed this Giorgione painting and the colors that you have within it. But it's not only going to be to do with color that you actually get magical effects. Uh, I think that your senses are strongly evoked by lots of the aesthetics of art. And it can also be to do with um, texture. So if you go to the V&A, you will be able to see this wonderful sculpture by Canova of the Three Graces. Um, I've lost all pictures and things. Yes, we've got it back now. Um, you've got this in, this um, sculpture by Giorgione, uh, by, um, Canova of the Three Graces. And people like it or hate it. It's notorious for the high quality of the finish that his craftsmen were able to put onto the marble. And that he has actually not only created these beautiful, graceful figures dancing and embracing, but also to give them this kind of flat surface. People dislike it as cold marble, but actually I really like it because it has this incredible smoothness as of an idealized kind of body where you have the cold, smooth, hard marble with all these rounded outlines of shoulders and uh, thighs and in particular buttocks, which mean that you have this very strong sense of a kind of idealized skin texture. And I like this a lot. I think this is a very magical kind of effect in neoclassical sculpture. But by the end of the 19th century, uh, there was a strong reaction against this. And if you go to the Tate and you look at the Rodin Kiss, which is there, you'll be able to see a complete rejection of the neoclassical finish, where 
this image is obviously a very powerful image of emotion and it relies not only on the body language and the rhetoric but also to do a lot in my opinion with the texture because by the late 19th century as is impressionist painting you have impressionist kind of sculptures where they deliberately didn't finish the surface they didn't polish it and what you've got then in this one by Rodin is the kind of power of the man's musculature in the muscles on the arms or the muscles on the legs and the uh, calf as opposed to on the woman uh, the kind of softness of the flesh as they embrace and famously as you know the hand is actually able to impress itself into her skin because he's managed to make it look so soft and how's he done it he's done it like michelangelo did by not actually finishing the texture of the final surface you can actually still see his sculpture marks all over her body as if he is touching her when he was touching the marble and you then have this sense of the cold marble actually being literally kind of warm flesh and therefore through texture you can actually create these kind of magical effects in art. But art can also, in my opinion, actually create uh, magical effects by things that are actually more abstract. Uh, last week, we were looking at Eric Gill as an artist of the occult, but what we're going to look at here are examples of the ill from slightly later in the 20s and 30s, where he was still, in my opinion, was able to actually use a certain kind of mastery to actually create uh, powerful images of the human body. And the old tradition was that you actually had to do life drawing and an academic life drawing was going to be very, very carefully modeled by the chiaroscuro, the light and shadow, which actually showed you all the anatomy of the body itself. Whereas in the early 20th century, lots of artists started to abandon chiaroscuro and to put the emphasis on uh, line. And I think that uh, Gill is very good at this. And when you look at this woman here, then you don't actually have very much shadowing to show protrudence of uh, belly or breasts. And instead, what he's done is to simply create by line these shapes that he thinks are beautiful in the woman's shoulder, her hips, her buttocks, and her breasts. And therefore, he became very keen on doing almost all the expression in his art through outline. And he produced a book in the 1930s of these black and white um, nudes where he had them <clears throat> printed on black paper and then he simply used white to actually draw the figures that he was creating. And he's got a complete control and certainty, I believe, over his use of the hand and the white chalk. Uh, he worked fast. He produced little sketches very, very quickly. And it seems marvelous to me, magical to me, the way in which he instantaneously captured the characteristics of what he wanted to emphasize. So again, you have the uh, outline of the arm and the shoulder, you have the outline of the belly, you have the outline of the breast, you have the outline of the thigh and the buttock. And these are creating for me, magically, the presence of a really alluring body there in his art. And he stylized it often into these kind of patterns where in this next picture you can see the way in which you've got the thing turned into literally nothing more than a silhouette. She's deliberately placed against all these plant forms, suggest how she is a kind of organic and how she is part of nature. And then as you can see there's actually a snake in here, so she's a temptress. And what tempts us? What is magical? It is the things that he picks out by silhouette, by outline, that makes his art magical. Now, this use of line was common in the early 20th century. You can link it to Picasso and Bedules, but most of all, you can link it probably to Henri Matisse. And Matisse had a phrase, which I think is what was being followed by Gill, of what he called essential line. And in 1909, he produced two versions of this picture called La Danse. This is the one in the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg. And then there's also another image produced for Shukin, which has ended up in the Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York. And he believed that the things that were essential in art to make it expressive were going to be colour and line. 
and it's thought that probably the colours in this are meant to first of all evoke uh, the blue of the sky, then the greenness of the grass and nature, and then in this version the pinkness or in the other version the redness of literally the blood flowing through these figures. And it seems to me that what he is doing is to go beyond actually just simply the aesthetics of beautiful line. And what he's doing instead is to begin to show bonheur de vivre, joy of life, which as you remember was actually a title of one of the sculptures by Gill we looked at last week. And the first version of La Danse is in the background of a little painting that Matisse did in 1906 called Bonheur de Vivre, Joy of Life. And therefore, when you look at this, you're not only looking at the way in which line itself is something beautiful that you can enjoy, but also you're looking at what I think is probably meant to be Bergson, the philosopher's idea of élan vital. Bergson claimed that there is a kind of life force within us a uh, biological life force within us that is actually the thing that gives us real joy in living as opposed to the bourgeois materialistic world in which we spend most of our time. And therefore in art, what you want to do is to recreate this joy of living, this bonheur de vivre. And he does so in my opinion, by the use of a central line. Because if you look at the figure on the left, if you follow from the heel, up to the armpit. Do you see there is this one big enormous curve that goes up through the body? And if you were a academic artist, you were expected to do a life drawing which showed the reality of the knobbly bits on the human body, all the bulging muscles, the concavities, the slight dislocations. Whereas what he has done, Matisse, is to pick out the essentials, the essential line that flows up from her heel, through her body, and then joins in this pattern where it moves through all the figures and eventually the final figure stretches out its hand to rejoin with the other. And therefore I think of this painting as a magical symbol of the joy of life, created by abstract art, created by colour and by shape and by line. And Adolf always had these paintings, a magical effect on me when I've been lucky enough to see the originals. Therefore, finally, I'm going to claim that there is something special and magical about the kind of grace that you can get from art. And if you look at the Botticelli Primavera, which we were looking at in an earlier talk, and looking at the way in which it embodied maybe the philosophy of Marsilio Ficino and Renaissance Florence on the notion of love in the world under the control of the goddess of love, Venus. And you have these three figures called the three graces. And these three graces have always embodied to me a kind of aesthetic artistic ideal, which has a magical effect on me when I see it. The word grace is a very difficult word. It ultimately originates in the Greek word charisma, which is again notoriously difficult to define and is some kind of powerful force that influences things. And it is actually a term that comes from religion. Divine grace is a gift from God to you that inspires you, that gives you life, that gives you what they would have called soul and which therefore is the peak of your existence. And I've always thought that Botticelli was very successful in this detail of the picture in showing the way in which art can actually create this feeling of grace. And it does so through all these different actual bits of rhetoric, the beauty of the girl's faces, the beauty of the proportions of their bodies, uh, the gracefulness of their dancing movements, the way in which line defines the outlines of their bodies, the way in which line helps to define the diaphanous thin drapery that clings to them and gives them a real presence. And therefore, it is this kind of grace in art that has always been the thing that I find most magical about art. So I've dismissed all the beliefs in real magic in art, though I find them very interesting.
And instead, I tried to pick out the things that I find magical in art and which have given me so much pleasure, both in enjoying it myself and in teaching it for so many years. Thank you, Robert. That was beyond brilliant. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, if you've got any questions, please type them into the chat facility and then unmute yourself to ask the question. It is. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Robert. That was very, very uh, good and enjoyable. And I, I just wanted to ask about <coughs> the, the second fertility icon you showed. Um, and and I, 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 where was it from and, and how, I mean, what was its age in relation to the first one? Uh, basically, I don't know. I'm not an archaeologist. Uh, I think it's French. Um, and again, I found it very easily. If you simply do a Google search for uh, prehistoric Venuses, it'll come up immediately. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. We've got some nice messages from Anne and Natasha as well. Um, any more questions? I'd like to ask one if no one else has got one. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, I remember a few years ago on the subject of uh, Giorgione's The Tempest, you told us that you'd come up with your own theory about what it meant, which was later disproved, but was nonetheless very interesting. Have you got time just to say yeah, again? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to explain. Um, yeah. I went there and it's a mystery painting. Nobody quite understands what it's about. And when I looked at the image, uh, there definitely seemed to be two different colours of clothing on the soldier's legs on the left. And it looked to me as if one leg had legging on it, and the other had the legging rolled down. And I thought I suddenly saw a mark there. And I came up with a completely new and original theory as to what the painting was about. Uh, Venice was notorious for being a victim of plague. And there were lots of written descriptions and paintings of literally being struck down by the plague. And when you're struck down by the plague, it suddenly comes from God as a punishment and strikes you and you're dead. In Venice, the main saint who you, this is the soldier on the left. Uh, you can see a difference, can't you, in the color of the two legs. Um, the soldier on the left is, um, uh, is, wearing, is wearing these clothes but one leg is definitely looking as though it has actually got its um, stocking rolled down as opposed to the other one and I thought I saw a mark on the inside thigh of his leg and in Venice there was one particular pa patron saint of the plague you prayed to when you wanted relief from the plague and that was St Roche and St Roche was a uh, saint who was a doctor in France who endured the plague, helped people with the plague, and became a saint because he miraculously survived it. But you can always recognize a painting of St. Roche because he rolls up his trouser leg and reveals the remains of a plague bubonic boil on his leg. Now, if that was the case, I have now solved the mystery of the painting where the painting is actually the plague striking the villages outside Venice. The soldier is St. Roche because he's got the wound on his leg. Uh, the woman feeding a baby at her breast is a conventional image of charity. And then that meant that the whole painting was going to be actually a symbolic version of what to do in the plague. Uh, be strong, pray to God, show charity and hope to survive. And then cruelly, a year or two later, one of my friends pointed out that the fashion in Venice in the 15th, 16th century was for multicoloured tights. And that meant that you did indeed have the two legs with different colours on them, but simply because he was a soldier wearing multicoloured tights. So I had to abandon that theory. It was a, gr a however, great theory, nonetheless. However, <laughs> however, there is a really poignant end to the story because one of the saddest things I ever had to deal with when I was a teacher was in the probably 80s. Uh, I had a kid in my class called Johnny Crane. And Johnny Crane was really nice. He was really intelligent. He was a, a sportsman. Uh, he was an away swing fast bowler. And he got leukemia. And when he went got leukemia, then he um, actually had to go into hospital for treatment. 
and we organized that we would go around and his friends from his form and try and see him. And I tried to think of what actually could kind of help to symbolize his situation. And I don't know whether it actually would have had any effect on him. He was about 12 years old. But what I did was to get a nice reproduction of Giorgione Tempest and get it as a card, which we all from his form signed and gave to him. And then I tried to explain what actually the painting might be about and how it might relate to him. And it was about the way in which you can suddenly be struck down by a storm, the tempest, which is the leukemia. But how you've got to be like the soldier, strong, and then you've got to be like the mother, the baby, loving and kind and charitable. And you hope that it will, you'll be able to endure the suffering of your illness. And he did indeed endure. He survived. In the middle school, he came back to the school. He took his O-levels. He would have gone on to have a really enjoyable, successful life uh, through university and whatever else he wanted to do. And um, he then got a recurrence of the illness. And just after he'd done his GCSEs, he died. And there is somewhere in the school, a cricket bat, which is the thing that is awarded to young cricketers in the school in memory of Johnny Crane, who died when he was about 15 or 16 years old. And that is one of the saddest things that ever happened to me in my time when I was teaching at Latimer. Thank you, Robert, how sad. Um, we've got a, a lovely message from Don, John Davidson uh, to say that it was a fa fascinating conclusion to this series, which, which provided a new way of looking at art. Thank you, Robert. Um, and then a final question from Greg. Um, Greg, do you want to unmute yourself to ask the question? Uh, hi, Robert. Thank you very much. Great talk and very enjoyable as ever. I just wondered, lots of your examples are representational and I can see why uh, early uh, paintings would would have seemed magical to, to people looking at them uh, because they would have made uh, the figures come to life. So, to speak. but I wondered what you thought would would be the magical effects of of abstraction, which is obviously not trying to represent reality in a magical way to bring it to life, but trying to represent something quite different. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on, on that. I agree that you need to go beyond the notion of the realism being the thing that creates the magic. But that's what I was trying to do at the end, where I tried to argue that the very aesthetic qualities of art are themselves the things that are magical. And I do actually think that most ways in which abstract art is abstract are actually based on uh, the way in which um, the human mind analyzes and essentializes, quintessizes uh, what is actually the human experience. So I picked on line, mm. and I argued that um, there are certain lines in the human body which are very expressive. And I think that's what actually the abstract artists were often using as the kind of abstract force of life that is within people that appears in their art. And I used the same argument, didn't I, for uh, colour and texture. And therefore, I do think that actually it's the not only the realism, but also the aesthetics of art that actually has this magical effect on people. I know that I can go to a painting by some obscure painter I've never seen before, never heard about, and I look at a particular combination of colours and I get a very strong sense of uh, joy. So I agree with you that it's not just the realism, it is actually the aesthetics of art that is most magical. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have a, a note from Catherine, um, just to say that your uh, Robert, your story of Johnny immortalizes him as he deserves. What a brave boy and how wonderful you remember him in a public forum. That will mean the world to his family coming from you. Thank you, Catherine. So, that brings us to the conclusion. Thank you so much, Robert. This lecture and your entire series on magical art has been absolutely fascinating. And a huge thank you to Tony for supporting Robert behind the scenes with presentations. If like me, you can't wait for more, please do follow the link to our forthcoming events page in the chat facility now.
On Tuesday, 1st of December, join Latimerian and former governor Sir Jim Smith for How We Came to Be. From egg to adult, a fascinating journey into the 40 trillion cells that make up a human being. And then after Christmas, we have another lecture by Peter Winter, former Latimer head, to look forward to. Join Pinter Peter on 19th of January for a tutorial in French literature, uh, Madame Bovary by Flaubert. I've also included a link to the donations page and a link to the video library where you can find recordings from all of our virtually speaking talks so far. That brings us to the end of today's lecture and the end of Robert's series on magical art. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Robert, for sharing your incredible knowledge. I hope to see you all again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.